Today I'll explain a series of measures the Territory Government is taking to further protect our citizens from the escalating threat of the coronavirus outbreak. There is a lot to explain, so I thank you in advance for your patience. First of all, let's make some things really clear. When it comes to dealing with the coronavirus, the NT is well prepared. While other countries struggle to control outbreaks, the actions we have taken so far have kept Territorians safe. We've acted fast, we put the health of Territorians first, and it shows. There continues to, be, continues to be no community spread of the virus in the Territory. I don't take this for granted though, not for a second. The truth is, with each day that goes by, with each new case that's confirmed in other parts of Australia, the more likely it is that there will be cases here in the future. So we are working harder, doing more to protect the Territory. We're ahead of the game and that's where we need to stay. Yesterday, the National Cabinet met and a number of important measures were agreed. There is now a self-isolation requirement of 14 days for any person, Territorian, Australian or otherwise, who is arriving from another country. This will be enforced in the Territory under the Notifiable Diseases Act. The Federal Government will ban cruise ships from foreign ports that are arriving here for an initial period of 30 days. This does not include vessels arriving here from Australian ports. The Federal Government has advised that special arrangements will be made for Australians who are currently on a vessel and will need to disembark. Acting on expert advice, we will also prevent non-essential, static, organised public gatherings of more than 500 people. This requirement will be enforced in the Territory under the Public and Environmental Health Act. But the most important word there is static, staying in the same place for a long time. So at this point, this rule would not include attending school or uni or working or catching a local bus. It probably will not include attending the markets, but I know there are a lot of questions about how this will work. So I've directed the Department of Health to develop a risk assessment tool that Territorians can use to judge the clinical risk associated with their event and whether their event can proceed today. That tool will be accessed on the Secure NT website later today. It includes a quick and simple process for assessing an event so that these events can be planned with confidence. There'll also be a hotline that people can use. We'll make that available on the website later today for people to be able to register their event and get that comfort about whether it's okay. Later today, we'll release an update on the status of events run by government that are on the horizon, whether they are going ahead, canceled, postponed, or amended. While we do have the power we need to enforce these requirements, I do not want to have to use those powers. I don't expect we will have to use those powers. I have confidence in the goodwill and good character of Territorians. You will do the right thing. You will look out for each other and you will look after each other. I said before that we are ahead of the game and we intend to stay that way. For the public service, we are stopping interstate work travel barring exceptional circumstances and reducing work travel within the Territory to essential travel only. Today, we are saying that all non-essential travel to remote communities needs to stop. Travel to a remote community must be for an essential service or for the supply and maintenance of essential goods and services. This decision will be enforced in partnership with land councils under the Aboriginal Land Act. I want to send a clear message to our fellow Territorians living in remote communities. We are not leaving you alone. Everything you need to be healthy and safe, you will have. The people that you need to be there will be there. But the health advice to us is also clear. You are safest in your home communities. To protect you, we are keeping non-essential people away from you. If you don't need to travel out of your community, then don't. Just like the rest of us, you are safer in your home community. I've also directed senior officials to consider further protocols for remote community access. We are leading the nation in this work. As the Prime Minister said yesterday, we are providing the model for other states and territories on how to keep vulnerable people safe. Finally, I've also directed that a task force be set up to advise on these issues, which will include the Aboriginal Medical Services, the Aboriginal Peak Organisations and Land Councils. The more we work together, the better prepared we will be and the safer we will all be. We know this is a health crisis, but that's not where it ends. The fact is our economy is going to take a hit from this. We can't stop the hit, but we can make sure that we're still standing at the end. And Territorians should know their government is working around the clock to protect businesses and jobs as much as possible. 
We've already released one stimulus package before any other government did. We acted first, we acted fast to protect the tourism industry and its jobs. And now we will act again on a second stimulus package this week. After this press conference, I will be going straight to a meeting with business leaders to discuss what that will look like. But it'll be all about keeping the shops open, the cash flowing, keeping territorians working, if we're going to protect territory business and jobs, we've got to work together and stick together, and that's what we're doing. But the most important people in this fight are territorians. We need you shopping locally, supporting local business and local workers. Our shops need you right now. The Cabinet's Security and Emergency Management Subcommittee will continue to meet every morning. I'll continue to meet regularly with my colleagues in the National Cabinet. Our next meeting is tomorrow night. Before Di and I take questions, I do want to talk directly to Territorians. I know there's a lot of new information coming at you every day. It can be confusing and concerning. There will be disruptions, there will be distractions, sometimes it will be a pain in the ass, but Territorians in tough times always stick together. Wash your hands, keep your distance, but most importantly, keep smiling and keep carrying on. That is the Territory way. We are in this together, we'll get through this together, and we'll come out the other side stronger. Thank you. Questions? Um, why is it unlikely that the markets won't be included in the future? I'll, I'll talk that a little bit, then I'll pass to Di. So in conversations with the Chief Health Officer and the Chief Medical Officer, so this is both at a local level and discussing it at that national cabinet level, it's about non-essential meetings of over 500. That's a simple way of discussing it. But really, it's about whether you're static or not and how long you're in close contact with people. So similar to the same reason why a train station is OK, the, the movement of people through it, markets involve a lot of movement of people. So I might just get Dai to expand on that. But we are, we are saying to people who run markets, you're not going to carve out. Schools get a carve out. You need to call the number and you go through the risk-based decision-making matrix to work out whether you're OK or not. And parts of markets, they use Middle Beach as an example, the beach and the grass area would not be okay around that close contact discussion, but I'll pass the die to discuss further. So what we're asking Territorians to do is to be very sensible and pragmatic about in, in implementing the social distancing that we're asking you to do. So the markets are okay, but we don't want you queuing closely for hours to get your favourite laksa. So please, you know, keep those queues to a minimum, separate yourself out from other people. And if you're not well, don't go to markets and public places. So that's the really important thing. We want people to take personal responsibility for protecting the community at large. So if you're not well, don't go out into public spaces. And if you're in public spaces, try not to be near people that are unwell um, if they happen to be around. And also just kind of keep your distance. Don't congregate for long periods of time. So at the Mindel Beach markets, for example, the sunset watching or everybody standing very close together for more than 20 or 30 minutes is probably not a good idea. But walking around the markets is perfectly safe. Market stall holders have already got hand hygiene um, methods in place. We will be increasing the amount of stations we've got for hand washing and hand hygiene and lots of messaging around good cough etiquette, sneeze etiquette and social distancing measures. So just be sensible. When you go to the shops, be sensible. Um, just stay away from large gatherings and we can get about doing our normal business. And I'm certainly not going to stop shopping at Casuarina. It's one of my favourite activities for my downtime. What my experience of the markets is that there's a whole heap of people who walk through that road area between the stalls on either side. Isn't there a serious risk that there could be a transmission passed on as people walk past each other in that really crowded space? So what we know about transmission is that if you are static um, next to somebody for more than 15 minutes, you are classified as a close contact of someone who becomes unwell. That is the kind of measure that we're using. And then if you are standing, uh, to, if you are in a room with people for more than two hours, then your risk increases. And so we're using those very real public health uh, measures to, to gauge what is safe and what is not safe. Are we going to stop this spread completely from our community? No. What we are doing is we are slowing the spread so that our health system can deal with the demand that this virus is going to put on it over the next few months. 
and we are making sure that those people who are going to get very unwell from this virus get the very best health care that we can possibly provide in Australia. We are working as a community to manage this virus and to make sure that our most vulnerable people are not infected. So if you're elderly, don't go to those places where there might be risk. If you're unwell with chronic disease, don't go to those places. Use common sense. Um, otherwise, just go about your normal business with that lens of being careful uh, in everything that we do. Don't shake hands, don't hug people. This is really sad, I'm a hugger. I like to hug my friends when I see them. And it takes quite a lot to step away from those social um, things that we do, you know, there's normal social actions. But we all have to kind of change our way of thinking over the next six months and just get through this together and we'll see it out the other end and I'll start hugging everyone again. Jack, how is the self-isolation being enforced or policed? I mean, under the Northern Territory laws, what is the punishment if someone doesn't do the right thing? So, I, while we have got powers of enforcement, we're not expecting to have to use them. And that's not just of recent territory experience around staying Territorians. Queensland actually monitored their self-isolation habits and they found 99% compliance over there. I double-checked that this morning with the Chief Health Officer. Uh, if you don't comply, then it can be up to six months. But, you know, I, I trust Territorians not to have to make us use the police. Six months prison, yeah, up to six months. How are you going to monitor that, though? Uh, so Queensland went through a quite a robust monitoring program with our 99% compliance. So uh, you probably don't need to go through that kind of regime. You don't need a police officer outside the houses. People are complying with these laws. So that's good. We know that. We've got recent evidence literally out of Queensland off the back of COVID-19 that people will comply with self-isolation. If you behave in a manner that is, you know, not good, then police have the powers to act. And that, I might pass the diet talk a bit further about that. So we don't have the capacity across Australia to monitor everyone who needs to be in self-isolation. So we are relying on people to do the right thing. If, uh, and also the community will self-monitor. So people will be calling you out. If you've been overseas and you go to the shops, people will be calling you out. And in the territory, everybody knows everybody's business and so really i think in the territory it's going to be very easy because the community will help us to um, keep that monitoring going and and we really think territorians will do the right thing that's what's happened to date and as things get more serious i'm sure that people are just going to um, do the right thing and take personal responsibility to keep our community safe well just how many people are you testing for possible coronavirus on a daily basis at the present time and at maximum capacity how many could you test? So the number of tests that we're doing on a daily basis changes um, as new advice comes out and um, more tests are required under the changing guidelines then the number of tests changes. What I can tell you is that we've done more than 500 tests to date in the Northern Territory and we only have one positive person out of those 500 tests but we are using the testing regime in a responsible way and we have done that from the outset. We are only testing people who meet the suspect criteria. People that just want to be tested who are well will not be tested. People who do not meet the criteria will not be tested. We need to preserve our testing capability. We are increasing that capability on a daily basis and we are also increasing the number of tests. It is a continually evolving situation. What's, but what's the uh, capacity today and what's the turnaround time on that test? So as I've said before, the turnaround time on the tests, the tests itself takes about four hours. The turnaround time will depend on where that test is taken in the Northern Territory and the ways in which we transport that test to the Darwin Laboratory to be run on those runs that occur twice a day, once in the morning and once in the afternoon. The actual total number of tests that we have the capacity for at the moment is expanding, so I wouldn't want to say an exact number at this point in time. Are there any testing in um, remote communities and do you have the capacity? 
capacity at the moment? So we can do the swabs in remote communities and then those swabs are transported into the Darwin Laboratory. We are looking at ways of expanding our laboratory capacity into Alice Springs, but this is a very specific molecular biology test that needs certain expertise and, and equipment to do. So we are looking at expanding ways of testing in Alice Springs, but we certainly will not be testing in every remote community. That's just not possible and it's not pragmatic. The tests will, will go into the major centre to be done. We have systems in place for those people awaiting test results to be self-isolated and to protect those communities whilst that's being done. How, how many ventilators? Sorry, could I just ask my big part? How many ventilators are there in the territory? So we have ventil we have ventilator capacity in Darwin for up to around thirty people, but we have more uh, ventilators in stock, and we can expand that. So we have surge capacity both in Darwin and in Alice Springs and we do have some ventilation capacity in our regional centres as well. We are well prepared for the, um, the surge of cases that are requiring critical care management. We have worked through all of that preparation and what we are doing now is public health measures to slow down the demand on our system so that we can manage it with the surge capacity that we have. I do what intensive care next? That's good. Cat then for the steel. No. Uh, mine was a flight one, so maybe just finish this one. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify at that surge capacity, how many people could be ventilated simultaneously in total? So I haven't done the numbers on simultaneous because it is an evolving feast. Um, so as I've said previously, we are increasing our surge capacity on a daily basis. We have multiple levels of ways in which we can manage the severe, the people who are severely ill from this disease, and we will continue to increase our capacity every day. Are you looking at stopping flights from Indonesia, Bali? We had one arrive this morning, given we saw that around China yeah, flights and the concern around numbers and containing it. In so that's an Australian government decision. It's currently um, level three travel restrictions or travel advice, that would be a level four stage. So that's a question with the Australian government about what they intend to do. At the moment, their advice is don't go overseas. Like coming back. Yeah, it's in, in, uh, no, you can't stop Australians returning. So that's a really important note. So Australians wanting to return home are allowed to return home. And that's, as discussed, is probably the greatest risk in terms of um, transmission would be Australians returning home, but we also cannot prevent Australians returning home. That's why we've gone for that 14 day isolation if you come back. So that's one reason why further, at this stage, I don't talk to the Prime Minister, at this stage further travel restrictions haven't been considered because it's probably that Australian contingent coming back that's the biggest concern and we can't stop that. Um, um, AMSAN's called for FIFO health workers going to remote communities to be screened as a matter of course. Is that something that's going to be implemented? Uh, so yeah. we have a protocol around 14 days overseas, but I'll pass a die around the rest. So the Territory remote communities rely on fly-in, fly-out services um, to, for essential services, so, so in both the health space and in the emergency services space. We will not be stopping those people from going into communities. If they have been overseas, they will self-isolate for 14 days and will not be allowed to go to remote communities. So there will be no additional we, screening measures? For there that. are no ways in which we can determine whether somebody will develop COVID-19 in that 14-day quarantine period. So you may test negative today if you're asymptomatic and then go out to the community and develop the disease in the next two or three days. So there is no, that is why we do not test people who are not unwell. We put them into self-isolation and self-quarantine and we watch for 14 days to see whether or not they become unwell. If they become unwell, we then test to see whether that is COVID-19 or not. There is no point in testing people who are not unwell. And so that would be a false sense of security um, and those people could potentially spread the virus in the community. So we are not testing people who are not unwell. How would you rate the likelihood at the moment of this disease making its way into your community? So at the moment, we're putting in a whole lot of measures to reduce the risk of this disease getting into the remote communities. I don't want to play the numbers game. We are just doing everything we possibly can 
and communities themselves are putting in place their own protocols around protecting themselves. So for example, the Tiwi Grand Final on the weekend, fantastic decision made by the local Tiwi Land Council and Tiwi people to keep that a local event and reduce the risk to their community. And we're seeing those very good decisions being made across the territory by land councils and communities. And we are supporting them with the information they need to make those decisions. We want to make sure that essential services continue into those communities. So we will make sure that supply lines remain open, that health services remain open, and that law and order and, and emergency services are available in those communities. You mentioned earlier there's been 500 <coughs> tests in the Northern Territory, there's only been one reported case of COVID-19, but what, in reality, would there, would there be more, would there be people walking around with the virus in the NZ? We have been very um, fortunate that the public and the community have responded um, very well to our calls to remain home if they're sick and to um, report into their GPs or to ring the hotline to find out whether or not they are at risk of COVID-19. We are fairly confident that COVID-19 is not in our community and certainly in South Australia where they um, tested everybody with a respiratory illness for a period of time, regardless of their risk, they found that there was no COVID-19 um, in the community. So some of the jurisdictions have provided us with that confidence that our measures are working. What advice have doctors been provided with? with respect to treating elderly people who might succumb to this disease? For example, have they been advised to uh, fight for every single life or given the relative <coughs> shortage of ventilators, say not to ventilate people over 70 if their cases collapse? So the public health measures that Australia has put in place are extreme and early measures in order to flatten the curve so that our health system will not be overrun and we will not have to make triaging decisions that have been made in other countries where the outbreak has um, gone unchecked. So we are doing these measures. We are putting community measures in place. We are asking everybody to participate in this Australian response so that our health system will continue to operate as it does. Yes, we will be stretched, but we have prepared for that stretch and we will get through this and we will make sure that we are able to provide health care at the level that we would expect in the Australian community for everybody that meets the criteria for going into an intensive care unit. All right, but contained in, within that, is, I mean, that's an aspiration, isn't it? We hope we'll get to that point. If we don't, what is We the... know from the modelling from overseas that what we are doing will work. We will flatten the curve. We have already stemmed the flow, the flow of the virus through the community. It is working and we are well on track. But the Australian government has also taken measures on Friday and over the weekend to ensure that we can continue to flatten that curve in Australia. We just need everybody to participate, to understand that life is changing, it will get back to normal in, in six or so months, and in the meantime, we will do what is right to preserve the health of the Australian community, and particularly for us, the Territorian community. So can you provide a guarantee then to... There are no people? guarantees in life. So there's no guarantee that the strategy will work and that you won't be in a situation where you have to triage? According to all of the best evidence that we have in Australia and across the globe, we are confident that what we are doing will protect the Australian community from having to make those difficult decisions that have been made in other countries. Do you hear any further, is there any further information about restrictions or potential restrictions for Kakadu and they're Australian government parks and they're joint managed with the traditional owners, so we're not aware of any further restrictions there uh, to this date. Chief, Chief, um, this is a summit that you're holding with business today. Is that to discuss what they would like to see as stimulus or have you already nailed down the stimulus and it's to inform them what it's going to be? So it'll have a couple of purposes. Um, I will brief them on the conversations I had at COAG with Dr Kennedy from Treasury, so he's the Secretary of Treasury federally, uh, with the Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia and to talk with them 
about the impacts they're experiencing, the impacts they're forecasting, and the outcomes that they're seeking so that we can make decisions around how and where we stimulate the economy. We'll make those decisions bearing in mind the federal government's decisions. That's why it was important that they acted when they did so we can work out the timing of when their stimulus is impacting and who, it's stim who it is impacting on so we can then either build on it or add to it or fill in gaps. So today it's very much about them fitting into us, the experiences that they're seeing, whether it's supply chain or customers or other scenarios or what they're forecasting based off supply chain and customers as pro two obvious examples. Um, and then so we can make some informed decisions off the back of that about how do we keep that cash flowing? How do we keep territorians working? That's really important right now that we keep people employed, that we keep that cash out of the economy. Why is that um, event closed to the meeting? Uh, it, it's a meeting with the business community. Dan Andrews um, said it's almost certain that schools in Victoria will close at some stage. Is that likely to be the case here as well? And what preparations are being made to perhaps um, have kids do lessons online at home and that sort of thing? So that's been discussed at national cabinet level. Uh, we have said essentially a watching brief. At this stage, schools are considered a safe place to go and, and essential. Um, what we have said, for example, is a different management plan needs to be in place for assemblies. Uh, if you have over 500 kids in assembly, stagger them or do something different. But at this stage, we believe schools are okay, but there is a watching brief on schools. The Department of Education is working on contingency plans. Uh, at a later date, we will advise what they may be if we need to, but I, I want to be careful we do this in the right way. And we scale up at the right time and send the right messages. So right now, I'll pass the diary to confirm this. Uh, schools are okay. Schools are making practices practice changes within their schools, say around assemblies, to manage things as well, but schools are okay. But do you, sorry, oh, I was just going to say, do you share the view of the Victorian Premier that it is likely that those schools... I fine? think rather than speculating, I'd rather say it's a watching brief and we'll make those decisions. So there is a, essentially a protocol in place right now that we haven't had to do here, I think, but Victoria and New South Wales have done. But I'll, I just want Di to touch on why schools are okay and how we're making that, what the current decision is. So in the Northern Territory, we only have one case and that case is isolated and he is getting um, better. And so we do not have community transmission in the Northern Territory. Our schools are safe. And in fact, our schools are the best place for our children to be because a lot of parents of those school children are now working hard to prepare the Territory for the COVID-19 uh, event. And so we want all those parents to feel secure that their children are being looked after at school, that they are continuing their normal lives and this is not impacting on children at this point in time. Things will change. Uh, we're hoping to get to the uh, school holiday period break without having to have any impact on school attendance and that's our aim at this point. But if the situation changes and schools become are not as safe as they currently are, then we will reassess that advice. At the moment, children are safe to go to school and it is the best place for them to be. And so we will not be closing schools in the Northern Territory unless the situation changes such that that health advice needs to change. Did the gentleman who caught coronavirus require ventilating? No. Um, given that you spent time in Canberra last week as well as Nicole Madison and we've seen Peter Dutton now come down with it, is there any concerns around your cabinet being exposed? I, know, I, I received a message from the Prime Minister while I was in the air, so I got it when I landed, um, letting me know that he'd been advised he didn't need to self-isolate and he was okay. He's the one I associated with in COAG. I didn't meet with Minister Dutton or Minister Frydenberg. I understand Frydenberg, Mr. Minister Frydenberg's test came back negative, so Nicole's also... Um, in the clear there. Um, <laughs> no, so I, I'm okay at the moment, but I did have a few thoughts going through my head, but I sort of knew. Sort of the treasurer home sick? Uh, treasurer's got a bit of a, a, a throat niggle, so we thought show good leadership work from home, uh, but there's no reason to believe it's coronavirus or that she needs to go through the testing regime. What about the health minister? She's been unwell too. The health minister was unwell last week, and again, we thought we'd show good leadership, and she worked from home, and she's now better and at work today is one of those ones where um, you've just got to manage it and I think we're all uh, at, you know all looking around if someone's coughing or sneezing people get concerned let's just be careful manage these things be mindful of others practice social distancing work from home if you can just take up good behaviors that'd be that'd be the medical advice from the diet absolutely yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. chief minister you are understanding that your meeting with business leaders is confidential you must have some proposals that you're planning to lay out um, to discuss with them at least to sort of 
plot the terrain. Can you give us a sense of the sorts of options you'll be canvassing? I'll, I'll, I'll talk to the principals. So today I want to be really clear to the business community about the principles we're seeking to get. So we want money spent, not banked. We want that money flowing. We want to keep people working. And it's really clear from the advice that you want to lean towards uh, screwdriver ready projects over shovel ready is the phrase that people will use. So things that can hit the ground and go. Um, that is a fait accompli. This meeting matters. I want to hear what they've got to say. I want to hear the ideas they bring forward. They may have supply chain issues or other issues that need to be considered for our decision making. And that will happen at that meeting. Is there a set amount of stimulus on the table from the federal government? Uh, so the advice from the federal government Yes. The or federal government's got 18 billion out there. We're, we're talking right. about the territories measures now. Are, are you drawing on federal funds? Is it coming from territory? No, so this will need to be. This is it, what, so what we're discussing today is territory government decisions and what the territory government will be doing from our budget. From our budget. So the, it'd be fair to say the advice very clearly from the Secretary of Treasury federally and from the Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia was go hard, go early, try same as we're doing with the health side of this, flatten the curve and reduce that impact. On, um, on territorians, territory businesses, territory workers. We have to do that. If we don't do that, then a bit like on the health scenario, you'll have a deeper, sharper impact that will last longer. So we've got to avoid that. So we will go hard, timely, targeted and temporary response to the coronavirus. That's what we need to do. We're having a chat with business today about some of the things that they're experiencing so we can make sure we take into all that into account and the outcomes that they're looking for, but that that will be that will be the approach that we'll be taking. Given that, given that all of this has got to be funded through borrowing, how much further into debt do you think it's reasonable to go to tackle this? Problem? So that that's a decision we will be making. Uh, but let's be really clear: this virus, coronavirus, will whack both the revenue and the expenditure side of the budget. That's just going to happen. But the advice from the Reserve Bank Governor and from the Secretary of Treasury is that now is the time to act. You cannot wait. You've got to hit, unfortunately, this is a message to every state and territory. The federal government's already done it. You have to hit the books and you have to make it count right now. Now's the time to act. We will get it done. Last one. Given we've seen, um, been avoiding person to person transmission in the community um, and delay that, is it likely that we will see that more cases here later than the other states? Like we could see a peak a lot later down the track rather than be on the same time frame as everyone else? I think the, I think we're going for the, the model where we're flattening the curve, so hopefully we never see a, a, a peak. Uh, sorry, apologies, that's not what you're going for in your question, but we are trying to flatten the curve and avoid that peak. The fact we've had no community transmission here in the Territory is a good thing. Um, we are looking at the national decisions that we've made that we're implementing here in the Territory because other states are starting to see community transmission trend towards the same rates as imported transmission. So we got ahead of that curve. That's why we were active when we acted. That puts the territory again in front of everywhere else because we do not have community transmission yet. So the longer we maintain this, the less impact there will be from a health sense, the less impact there will be from an economic sense. So that's why we're making the decision we're making. Do you just want to add to that last question, sorry? Yeah, so it's really important that we buy as much time as we possibly can to prepare, to buy extra equipment, um, to get those supply chains um, flowing from those countries that are recovering from the coronavirus. And so there is a whole lot of reasons why we want to delay the outbreak situation in the Northern Territory as long as possible and across Australia. So these methods, eventually we will have coronavirus in our community and we will recover from it and we will develop herd immunity and we will go on with our lives and it will just become another disease in the background. But at the moment, what we need to do is flatten that curve out so our health system can manage it when it does happen. All right, thank you everybody.